With the release of The Batman, I'm going back and reviewing each of the theatrically released Batman movies that I hadn't previously reviewed on my channel. Today we're talking about Batman Returns. Hi, my name is Sean and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Let me know your thoughts on Batman Returns and give me some context. Are you someone that grew up watching Batman Returns or are you newer to the film? I'd love to hear your take on the movie. As we go into this, I have already seen the Batman and I've posted my review for it. You can check that out somewhere up here if you want to know my thoughts on the new Batman movie. So if you've been following along in this series, in my review for for Batman 1989, I talked about how that's one of the very first movies I remember seeing in the theater and one of the movies that kind of kick-started my love of movies, nerd culture, collecting stuff, and just kind of being obsessed with way too much stuff in regards to the things that I love. And I pointed out that I even had a full set of the trading cards for Batman 1989. But when it comes to Batman Returns, it's almost like the next step in the process, where Batman Returns is one of the first movies that I remember following its production. As best as you could back in the early 90s, pre-internet, but they would report things in the newspaper, they would put out little periodicals and give you little updates and I actually, as best I could, was tracking along with everything that they were released about Batman Returns, went to go see it in the theater opening weekend, and once again, collected the full set of trading cards, which I still have to this day. And also, much like Batman 89, I had it on VHS tape as soon as I could buy it and watched it over and over and over again. And I was also one of the kids that collected all of the little McDonald's toys that they put out. I believe they also had collector's cups that you could have, and we collected all of it. I'm pretty sure in my garage, I have a box covered in a thousand other boxes that's filled with old McDonald's toys and Batman Returns cups uh, because we, we just collected all that stuff and it very much was an early version of what I now do for a living. So much like Batman 89, this movie was a huge part of my childhood, a huge part of turning me into the person that I am today and making me love Batman, comic book movies, and movies in general and nerd culture. But does the movie hold up? Let's get started talking about the good. With this movie, I think it's best taken as Tim Burton's melancholy superhero movie about three lonely weirdos. Those three people being Batman, Catwoman, and Penguin. Each of them are characterized by the fact that they're very different from society, they're isolated in their own way, and then it, throughout the course of the movie, we see how they respond to the fact that they have been rejected from society in their own way. So in the case of Bruce Wayne, he lives in his mansion. He does a little bit of Wayne Enterprise type stuff, but for the most part, he's very reserved. And then at nighttime, turns into a superhero and fights crime. Catwoman is, despite the fact that it's Michelle Pfeiffer, she's made to be this awkward receptionist, office manager that doesn't know how to connect with people, lives alone in her apartment and isn't getting calls back from boyfriends, and she's a weird cat lady, which is amazing because it's it's also Michelle Pfeiffer, who of course is a gorgeous woman, and so, so put glasses on her and mess her hair up a little bit, and then she's an ostracized weirdo all of a sudden, and then once she is killed and reborn as Catwoman, suddenly she finds a bravery and courage through the fact that she's kind of completely snapped and lost her mind. And then with Penguin, right out of the gate, his parents reject him as a monster, try to kill him, and then he's raised by circus freaks, lives in the sewer, and just all he has is like disdain for society and a desire to burn it all down, really because he's been rejected. And then as you go through the course of the movie, as you get just little little tastes of acceptance from people, like maybe they want him to run for mayor, immediately he grabs for any amount of attention and praise from people that he can get any acceptance. He wants it. And then when they turn on him, he slaps back with kind of a mean-spirited plot to kill all the children in the firstborn, children in the sun. There's a lot of Exodus, Moses-type imagery about 
Him being put in the basket and sent away down the river, killing firstborn sons. Just a lot of kind of deep, rich themes in this movie. And as I said, it's Tim Burton's melancholy superhero movie right out of the gate. Movie starts and you got the Danny Elfman score setting the tone and then he's born and the first thing you see is his parents being horrified at what he is, seeing him as even as a baby, like killing a cat or something like that. And then his parents try to murder him or abandon him basically in the cold, in water. And just right there, you know the movie that you are in for and the type of film it is. And I think this one is much more so a Tim Burton film where they trusted him more because the first film was such a big, gigantic hit. He was more assured as himself as a director. And so they kind of let him do his own thing. You got to look at the, the Batman 89 and I don't feel like Tim Burton was the one like, what if we had like a bunch of Prince songs in here? Like what if just Prince kept, uh, they busted out the song. And in fact, Joker's dancing through a museum to Prince songs. That doesn't seem like a Tim Burton idea. That feels like Warner Brothers being like, Hey, we got an awesome idea. And with this movie, you really start to get the Tim Burton vibes. And Tim Burton's always been someone that gravitates towards these weird, isolated characters. Even his first movie, Pee-wee's Big Adventure, who, as it turns out, Pee-wee plays Oswald Cosmo Potts' dad in the beginning of this movie. That's Pee-wee Herman. But Pee-wee Herman is this weird guy lives by himself, and is, his best friend is his bike. And then right around the same time, Edward Scissorhand, this weird character that is rejected by much of society that's trying to find a way to fit in. That's what the movie's all about. And so you've always had that in his part of his films, but very, in the early movies, it was just saturated with these ideas about lonely weirdos. And in the case of this movie, it's a, it's a movie all about exploring weirdo comic book characters. Now, the glue that just holds this movie together is Danny Elfman's score. Now, back in the late 80s, early 90s, Danny Elfman was just on an insane hot streak. And the Batman 89 score, one of the best superhero scores of all time, especially the main theme, I think with this movie... All the other stuff is just phenomenal of just how much emotion it pulls out of you, how vibrant it is, how it can take sequences that are kind of ridiculous, like the death of Penguin and then the penguins like pull him into the water. There's just like a silliness to it, but the music, the score is just so unbelievably good. And that runs throughout the entire movie that it just gives everything uh, a more robust sense of emotion, sense of feeling to all of it, because it was just so good and perfectly captured the emotion, the the feeling that Tim Burton was going for with each and every sequence. Now, one of my big criticisms of Batman 89 is that the storytelling and the story were pretty very choppy, especially in the middle of the movie. It just felt like a series of isolated scenes that were in chronological order, but one didn't lead into the next one. A lot of parts you could just change the order around and it wouldn't really matter. It's very choppy. And I feel here, it, it does a much better job of telling its story in a consistent fa fa uh, fashion with a smoothness to the storytelling. And so I just, in general, the script was stronger, the storytelling was stronger, and it just makes for a, a more fluid experience watching the movie. And of course, with this movie, you gotta talk about the villains. We touched on the fact that um, Catwoman and Penguin are these lonely weirdos as Tim Burton liked, but there's a lot more to their characterizations than that. So with Catwoman, Michelle Pfeiffer just gives this amazing, crazy performance that fits the movie that she's in perfectly, where as much as she is this gorgeous woman, when she's playing insecure Selena Kyle, you buy into the fact that she's a lady that's just too weird, too awkward, too unsure of herself to be able to connect with people as much as she wants to, and thus kind of pushes them away through her odd behavior. 
And then you equally buy it when she breaks down after she comes back from the dead and goes back to her apartment and just freaks out. You believe that this is a person coming undone. And then when she becomes the confident, insane Catwoman out for revenge, you equally buy into that. And there's lots of fun interactions that she has with Bruce Wayne as they're attracted to one another and slowly figure out, wait a minute, that's the person, the person I'm going on a date with is the person I've been fighting at nighttime. And those are all just fun situations. And then also just when it comes to the, the performance uh there's all sorts of stuff, stories about behind the scenes about how Michelle Pfeiffer went and trained with a whip because she wanted to be able to pull off so many of these different things that she was doing in a convincing manner. Anthony, the longest. He was a great teacher. And Michelle's three months of training really paid off. She performed this difficult and potentially dangerous scene perfectly on the very first take. In any time the actor actually commits to the physicality of the performance, the, but all of it, not just the dramatic scenes, but also getting in on the action, you just feel that it's a much more holistic performance. And she becomes this tragic character because of all of this. Because you see her as just this sweet person at the beginning, something horrible happens to her, and she snaps... And it takes her on this tragic path of revenge where, at the end, all she cares about is destruction. And at the end of the movie, I guess it implies that she's not dead. We were supposedly going to get a Catwoman movie starring her. Instead, we got this horrendous thing starring Halle Berry. I would have much preferred Michelle Pfeiffer to have gotten her own Catwoman movie, but hey, it never happened. And then you have... The Penguin, played by Danny DeVito. And this is very much Tim Burton's Penguin, where he's literally like a penguin man raised by circus freaks, and he has flippers for fingers. He's a, a, an actual monster with gross teeth and all sorts of things about him that that that's not really what you find in the comics, especially by the time this movie came out. He was had been rewritten to be a very different type of character who was like under, running underground crime and stuff like that that you see in all the renditions over the last 30 years and in the comics. This is literally Tim Burton freak version of him. And Danny DeVito was the perfect actor to portray this version of the character that can be funny while being gross at the same time. He can be a monster, but still have some sort of likable factor to him. He can do these over the top moments and you still buy into it. You, you just see his crazy eyes and you know what's going on. And so this is a movie where just a lot of really great casting going on from the people that returned from the previous movie, and then they added in solid people as villains. And then the other one that it doesn't get talked about nearly as much, but you have Christopher Walken as Max Shrek, just kind of this kind of almost evil version of Bruce Wayne, another rich person in town, but this one trying to, with without a good heart, and manipulating everyone around him. He's the one that kills Selena Kyle, and so she has to be brought back as Catwoman. He's m messing with uh, being manipulated by and manipulating himself. The Penguin, just this really sleazy, awful person, and Christopher Walken is able to pull that off perfectly. That's like his thing. And this is this movie was my introduction to Christopher Walken because most of his other stuff prior to this movie would wasn't really stuff I was watching as a little kid. So this movie was my introduction to Christopher Walken. So when it comes to this movie, I think it, it does a lot of things to improve on Batman 89. The cast is once again great as it was with the first movie. Production design, very cool once again. Score, top notch, just like it was before. And it, it has some really deep, resonant themes that pull out big emotions, especially when combined with that Danny Elfman score. But I don't really think that either one of Tim Burton's Batman movies are great representations of Batman or fantastic films in and of themselves. So let's move on to the bad. And I kicked off the good by talking about how this movie works best as a Tim Burton melancholy superhero story about lonely weirdos. The flip side of that coin is that this isn't a very good Batman movie. It's a, it's a good Tim Burton movie about his made up characters. 
but it's almost weird how little Tim Burton seemed interested in Bruce Wayne and Batman as a character. In both of his films, he's kind of on the back burner, takes time to even introduce him into the story, and then it's really the villains in both films that are given a lot of time, a lot of development, and taken on a journey. In the case of this movie, Batman shows up in the intro sequence where all the clown freaks show up, kind of messing with the Christmas celebration. And so he shows up, torches a couple guys with his Batmobile, meets Selina Kyle for the first time, and then it mostly disappears for the rest of the first act. And then we start spending time following Max Shrek into the sewers where he meets Penguin. We spend some time with Selina Kyle and see how lonely she is. And like Bruce Wayne is in a meeting with Max Shrek about the power and the mayor's there. So you have a couple things where he shows up. But the whole first act is really about the villains. It's letting us meet them, figure out what they're up to. And then when Batman does join in on the fun, it's not like he has an arc. It's not like Bruce Wayne grows, changes by the time you get to the end of it. You know, a little bit of romance with Catwoman. Of course, that's fun. And it's not that Michael Keaton's doing anything wrong with his performance, but he's just not the focus. The story is not about him growing and changing. It's about him responding to what everyone else is doing and responding to the changes the other characters are, are going through. Along those same lines, as a Batman story, I mean, the movie kicks off and in the beginning sequence, he, he like flips the Batmobile around and torches a guy, sets him on fire. In the middle of the movie, he attaches a bomb to a guy and pushes him into the sewer, blows the guy up. I mean, Tim Burton's Batman... No qualms with killing people. No apparent problems with guns because he had Gatling guns on the Batmobile and the Batwing in Batman 89. And so it just doesn't really come off that much like Batman. Comes off like a Tim Burton character, but not even the focus of the movie. And, th and that's really disappointing. And there's there's just some weird things the movie puts in there that just kind of just stood out to me rewatching it. The Penguin is... A little bit too horny, which if there's a couple lines here and there, it might work. But when he's the only character behaving in a specific manner in two different movies, pushing things heavily in a specific direction in such a crass manner, and he's talking about his flipper trick and stuff like that, you're like, that's a that's a bit much. It just stands out a little bit, just kind of a little bit awkward way of doing things. But really, when it comes to this movie in general, it it's such a... Such a dark film while being cartoonish at the same time that it, it never, I can't really connect with it all that well. Because it's a movie where when the penguin steals the Batmobile and rewires it, it then cuts to the penguin sitting in one of these little kitty rides that they put at Chuck E. Cheese and in front of like in malls and stuff like that, where you put 50 cents in and it goes up and down like this. They literally have Penguin as a 45, 40 year old man sitting and going like this, rocking back and forth, driving the Batmobile like that. Like it's so cartoonish. And then we cut to another sequence where it's like Penguin has kidnapped every firstborn child in Gotham and is going to drive them into toxic ooze to both drown, toxic waste them to death. And, and the two things just don't go together with me. And it, it, it makes it for a movie that I, I just kind of watch at arm's length because while it, it gets the melancholy tone right with the big emotions, the other side of the tone of the movie can feel off with just how cartoonish, almost campy with some of the stuff with Penguin combined with just really dark, dark plot points. And along those same lines... As you move into the third act, it feels a little bit like Tim Burton wanted to do this really dark third act where all the kids are kidnapped, Penguin's about to run them into the water, and then Batman shows up to save the day. Now, right off the bat, the idea that every firstborn child of Gotham is kidnapped and no police officers saw this, no, no one in the city did anything, no one called anyone... First off, immediate, and they're driving around in a little choo-choo train around town to do that. Immediately, that, that just strains credibility. Immediately. But as you're watching the movie, basically this plot point is introduced. And then in the next scene, Batman shows up, stops this from happening, and a note is re 
given to Penguin saying it's not going to happen. And then immediately it cuts to Penguin giving a speech to Penguins where he then decides that he's going to send Penguins out to the main center to blow everything up. Once again, we went from let's drown all the, the, the little kids, all the firstborn little, little boys, let's drown them in toxic waste to let's strap rockets to Penguins. It's like, those are two very different emotions, two very, very, very different things, two very different tones that you're, you got right next to each other. But I mean, this whole plot line about killing all the children, it, it, it's, it's in there and then it's over with before anything happens with it. And immediately a totally different third act is introduced. We set up Batman has to save the kids and immediately that is cut off and we're introduced to just kidding, going to blow up the city which feels like they shot something and the studio heads went, no, you are absolutely not going to have kids in a train going into water. You got to do something different. I don't know if that's how it played out or if it was the right, I don't know, but it's just very awkward to set something so distinct up and then go, nope, instead we're going to have the penguins with rockets on their backs. And that's the, the you know, so it kind of felt odd to me too. So this is, a, it's always a tough one for me because I feel like there's more specific things I can nitpick about what's wrong with Batman 89. But this one always, I felt like, is a little bit more at arm's length. I can praise a bunch of things about it, but I can never fully feel like I'm connecting with it as much as I feel that I should. Real quick, before I give you my final score on this one, be sure to join me down below in the comments section. Let me know what did you think about Batman Returns and is this a movie you grew up with? Is this a movie that you're watching for the first time more recently? Also, I'm actively in the process of reviewing all the Batman movies and I have already re reviewed The Batman. You can check those out right up here when this video is over. In closing, Batman Returns is a movie that does a lot of things right, has some phenomenal casting, some interesting characterizations, but I don't think it's a very good Batman movie, though it is a pretty good Tim Burton, melancholy superhero movie exploring three lonely weirdos. At the same time, it's a movie I always feel it's a little bit at arm's length from me, and so I maybe I respect parts of it more so than I fully enjoy it, but I do have a fun enough time when I watch it every couple of years. Overall, I'll give this one a B- minus on the entertainment scale, a 6.5 out of 10, and it's worth checking out if you're a big Tim Burton fan or a Batman completionist, but I don't think this is a movie that would be fully embraced by most modern Batman films because it is such a Tim Burton recreation, reimagining of Batman, Penguin, and Catwoman rather than a faithful adaptation. If you enjoyed this review, check out my other Batman reviews right over there. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies too much.